Hello, Agora.io. It looks like we're live now. Um, I am just about to get started. I'm Darian Warden. I am doing a presentation today on the modern school movement, um, which was a educational experiment that took place uh, around the world, but primarily what I'm focusing on is in the United States, and it was between 1910 and 1958. So we've got uh, 16 viewers. Um, I'll see if I can get the chat working by the end so that I'll be able to take questions. Hopefully I won't talk for too long and I'll be able to get to questions. Um, I've got the just in chat running, um, but we'll see. So we've got 16 viewers now, so I'll start. The modern school movement um, was an educational experiment that took place uh, around the world, but really took root in the United States from 1910 until 1958. It was based primarily upon the ideas and the example of the Spaniard Francisco Ferrer, um, and it stressed uh, freedom for the pupil to develop, um, not according to rigid doctrine, but to achieve their full personhood. And this was put into place in several, it, well, across the U.S., but there are several that really took root and actually a few daily schools based on this method. So a lot of what I'm saying today is based on research that I did for the Modern School Movement Digital History Project, which you can find online at themodernschools.wordpress.com. That's where um, the project is. A lot of the information um, I'm using is relying on Paul Average's uh, book, The Modern School Movement. And this book was originally published by Princeton University Press in 1980. Let's see if we can get it up there, all right. Um, and there is a newer version published by AK Press. Oh, this is a little complicated, um, but you get the idea. Uh, there's a version published by AK Press, um, an anarchist publisher, and you can find it on Google Books. Um, I think the version on Google Books is posted with the pages in reverse order for some reason. Um, there's a link there at the Modern School Movement Digital History Project, themodernschools.wordpress.com. So I'm going to talk about the origins and the philosophy of the Modern School Movement, how the schools were established, how they worked, uh, why the project declined, and what lessons the modern schools might present for those of us seeking a radically more free society today, a radically freer society today. So the origins and philosophy, um, now this, a lot of this beginning stuff is on the website, the Modern School Movement, but I'm not just reading uh, word for word through the whole thing, so don't worry, I'm not completely wasting your time here. Um, Francisco Ferrer y Guardia, um, my Spanish is not good, so feel free to laugh. Um, who is more commonly known as Francisco Ferrer, was born just outside of Barcelona in 1859. He rejected the Catholicism of his parents and became a free thought adherent. He was also a radical Republican in his younger days, and in 1885, following a failed uprising against the Spanish monarchy, he fled to France. It was in France that he was heavily influenced by anarchist thought and he was inspired by Paul Robin's Libertarian School at Sempu, uh, C-E-M-P-U-I-S. And Ferrer began tutoring uh, people in the use of the Spanish language uh, to make a living. 
a wealthy French woman that Ferrer tutored was impressed by Ferrer and his ideas, and uh, she was considerably older than him. She left him half of her estate when she died. Um, and with this money, he returned to Barcelona in 1901, and he founded a school there. Um, in English, it would be the modern school. The educational program of Ferrer can be summarized with several points. Um, and this is a lot, a lot of this information is from Paul Average, who researched this extensively. And uh, the, the points are uh, one, a focus on what they call the self realization of the pupil through opportunities to develop knowledge and skills rather than a focus on drilled instruction. Two, a lot of anti church and anti state sentiment. In Spain, the Catholic Church wielded tremendous political power. Ferrer did not want children to be indoctrinated into the church program or into nationalist ideas. Three, an anti-authoritarian atmosphere. Teachers were supposed to guide students in learning, not drill uniform lessons. Rigid discipline was not enforced, and rooms were not arranged in orderly rows with a teacher having a raised desk. Neither punishments nor grades were employed. And if you go to the Modern School Movement uh, History Project website, you'll see a picture of the Stelton School where there's a long table with a number of children sitting there, um, one sitting on the table reading. Um, the, the teachers are just kind of walking around helping them. Um, so the arrangement of the classroom was taken into consideration. For an emphasis on the individuality of each student, rather than an established program for everyone to follow, um, this doesn't mean that there weren't uh, particular methods of instruction that were universally used by some teachers, um, but this was one of the ideals. Five, an emphasis on learning through experience and what they call integral education of physical and intellectual activity. Ferrer education included field trips to museums, factories, and the outdoors, as well as arts and crafts. Some modern school instructors went so far as to even discourage reading by younger students if they thought they weren't ready yet. Education, uh, number six, education was a continuous lifetime process. Adult classes on subjects like hygiene, health, language, art, philosophy, science, literature, and philosophy took place at Ferrer schools. Um, this is especially interesting in light of number seven. Education was meant to be made available to everyone, not only the wealthy classes. Ferrer schools catered to working class children and adults by keeping tuition low. They were co-educational both in gender and in the social origins of students. Number eight, the school was both an instrument of self-development and a lever of social re regeneration. Ideological instruction varied among Ferrer schools, but frequently instructors would instill values of liberty, equality, and social justice into students. And Ferrer's textbooks had a general anti-statist, anti-capitalist, and anti-militarist line. Schools often included instruction in Esperanto, which was an international language that was meant to promote solidarity among different nationalities. Um, so uh, just uh, for everyone, um, I've got the chat up here. I will hopefully get to your questions later, but uh, I will continue with uh, what I'm doing here. And uh, I've already got, all right, I see, all right, I'm seeing questions in the other chat room, and I will get to uh, the questions. Uh, right now, uh, Stefan Kinsell asks, what about Montessori? What about unschooling? Um, I will get a little bit into this later, and um, these were somewhat influenced by some of the people involved um, which uh, in the modern schools, which I'll get into later. Um, so uh, fortunately, I, I managed to get to the right chat, so I'll be, I will be able to answer your questions later. Um, 
So moving on, um, Ferrer earned the ire of the authorities for his successful schools of science and subversion. They blamed him for a failed insurrection in Barcelona known as the Tragic Week, which was July 26 through August 1st, 1909. Though Ferrer did not initiate or lead the insurrection, he was executed after a sham trial on October 13th, 1909, and it's generally believed that this was because uh, his educational efforts were really angering the authorities. Um, but Ferrer's death caused an international outrage, particularly among anarchists and liberal and socialist freethinkers, and he became a martyr. Interest in his ideas took off worldwide and became firmly established in the United States. On June 3, 1910, the Francisco Ferrer Association was founded at the meeting place of the Harlem Liberal Alliance. Anarchists took a leading role in establishing Ferrer schools. Alexander Berkman and some of his comrades had already founded a modern Sunday school before the Liberal Alliance meeting. The United States was not a stranger to educational experiments uh, based on libertarian and socialist ideas. Um, what distinguished Ferrer schools was their affiliation with the legacy of Ferrer usually belonging to the Francisco Ferrer Association or its successor from 1916, the Modern School Association of North America. While the example of Ferrer was interpreted in different ways, his ideas were appealed to as the guiding principles of the Ferrer Modern School movement. Um, and once again, there are, Ferrer didn't just come up with his ideas out of nowhere. He was influenced a lot by what he saw in France However, he, his death uh, really brought him and his project to international prominence and uh, the outrage of the attack on him uh, really brought more people to sympathize uh, with him. So I mentioned the anarchist movement. At the time, there was a very large anarchist movement worldwide. Um, Spain uh, will have a very uh, well-known anarchist movement. And there was a large anarchist movement in the United States as well, both immigrants and uh, native-born Americans, and both, um, well, the uh, ideology really um, transferred between Americans and Europeans. Uh, there's a lot of exchange of ideas. and. While not everybody involved in the schools uh, was an anarchist, uh, they really um, took a leading role in, in getting these established. Ferrer himself might or might not have been an anarchist, but he was certainly friendly to anarchists in Spain, some of which worked with him uh, in the modern school. Um, from uh, in the 1910 Encyclopedia Britannica, anarchist theorist Peter Kropotkin introduced anarchism thus, anarchism from the Greek contrary to authority, the name given to a principle or theory of life and conduct under which society is conceived without government. Harmony in such a society being obtained not by submission to law or by obedience to any authority, but by free arrangements concluded between the various groups, territorial and professional, fully constituted for the sake of production and consumption, as also for the satisfaction of the infinite variety of needs and aspirations of a civilized being. Emma Goldman, a well-known anarchist who would be heavily involved in the modern school efforts in New York, commemorated Ferrer. She said, on the 1st of September, 1909, the Spanish government, at the behest of the Catholic Church, arrested Francisco Ferrer. On the 13th of October, after a mock trial, he was placed in the ditch at Montjuich prison against the hideous wall of many sighs and shot dead. Instantly, Ferrer, the obscure teacher, became a universal figure, blazing forth the indignation and wrath of the whole civilized world against the wanton murder. So schools were established throughout the United States uh, shortly following Ferrer's death. Um, a lot of what were established were Sunday schools. Um, the you know for 
generally catering um, towards working class youth, though it was not um, exclusively oriented uh, for a particular social class. Um, and a lot of the schools that were established in the early days didn't last all that long. There was kind of an initial enthusiasm and uh, then there weren't a whole lot of people putting work into the specifically for rare schools. Um, and there were also a lot of adult centers. Um, but there were a, there were daily schools um, for youth. Um, initially in uh, New York City, there was one um, that was established uh, in 1911. And uh, it uh, was there until 1915. Um, I'll get into that one a little bit later. And uh, one of the more famous schools is the one in Stelton, New Jersey. There is also a daily school in uh, Mohegan, New York and uh, Lakewood, New Jersey. You can look at these at an awesome map on the Modern School Movement website if you are so interested. Um, so they, they really they worked according to the principles uh, that Ferrer set down and that people were trying to follow. Uh, students were generally not coerced. Um, they had a variety of activities available. Um, one student uh, remarked that he was bored with his uh, government school and they, he, he met a, a, a student of the modern school in New York. He went in there and he was just amazed. There was just a bunch of people, students and a teacher around a table looking through a microscope and, and he was really excited about this. Um, a lot of times when children misbehave they would basically just be uh, sent outside um, to not get the lessons until they were ready um, to to learn according to uh, what the class was doing. Um, and there were eventually communities formed around uh, Ferrer schools um, which I, I'll get into a little bit later. So some some before I get into really the effects and the downfall of the schools some lessons that they would contain for anarchists and radicals of today. Um, the modern school movement was a project that people of varied philosophies could get involved in. I mentioned that there was a lot of uh, anarchist uh, involvement. Alexander Berkman, Emma Goldman were very involved. Uh, Voltaire de Clare uh, was involved in the school in Philadelphia for a little while. Um, but there are other people, um, some Georgists, uh, some uh, socialists of, uh, of uh, you know, different varieties, and um, they, they got involved because they saw this as something positive. But uh, for an anarchist, this is a way to kind of get anarchist principles working in a part of society um, you know, actually putting them into practice in a way that other people are participating. So I think there's something to be learned from that, that there's a value to other people outside of anarchism of this, and they're, um, they're getting involved. And especially with the New York Center, while it was there, um, there is a large adult education element of that and a lot of conferences were held there. Uh, intellectuals of the day and radicals would rub shoulders and uh, talk with each other and it's you sh should really consider the benefit to intellectual life that was there. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about a particular individual of interest in the New York School and that's Will Durant. He uh, would eventually become a very famous, uh, well, I don't know, very famous, but a prominent, certainly, um, American intellectual. He actually received a medal from Gerald Ford for his contributions uh, to, intele to American intellectual life. But in the early days, uh, in the 1910s, he was uh, a radical from the New York area, and 
he was attracted to the idea of the modern school and he began teaching there. And he was a socialist at the time, but teaching at the modern school uh, got him friendlier towards anarchism. And I think that's a, a lesson to be learned that if you have something that uh, anarchists are involved in and it's working and it excites people and you have, um, you make a positive impression, um, and, you know, maybe it might not get people permanently in the anarchist mode, but they get thinking along the lines of anarchism, maybe some other ideas uh, that they wouldn't have looked at before will be more interesting to them. And another aspect of the modern schools is that the um, diversity of them. A lot of the teachers and administrators were native-born Americans, often Anglo-Saxon descent. Um, but a lot of the students were poor immigrants, um, a lot of Jews, and I think this is, uh, you know, something that shouldn't be taken lightly. Um, you know, when we think of the kind of backlash against immigrants and the tough conditions of the poor in the early 20th century, to have something that kind of crosses class lines and tries to bring people up and get people actually participating as free equals in the improvement of their lives is something that is, is quite remarkable. And obviously, I, I think it's a useful project today um, as an anarchist to establish alternatives to the coercive authoritarian model of schooling that's used by government in uh, most private schools today. So uh, obviously, those are out there. Um, there's unschooling. Um, there's Summerhill. There's uh, a number of those out there. but. Um, it's, it's interesting to see the anarchist influence on some of these earlier. So I'm going to go into some of the effects and legacies of the modern schools. Uh, graduates of the modern school tended to excel in later academic pursuits. They weren't, you know, just uh, playing the whole time. They were learning, uh, and that might look like play. And I, I think this is exemplified by the first graduates of the Stelton Colony. Um, in, they, in 1917, uh, Ray Miller, Shedlovsky, and Emma Cohen entered high school at New Brunswick. Um, the modern school there, at least at the time, did not go full through to high school. So they, they went to high school in New Brunswick, and they made a strong showing. Uh, Emma Cohen graduated as valedictorian. Historian Paul Average notes that of the modern school graduates he encountered uh, many years later, uh, he says, quote, the great majority have carried away a strong cooperative and libertarian ethic, a spirit of mutual aid and individual sovereignty, which has remained with them throughout their adult years, regardless of their politics or occupations. So this is kind of interesting uh, if you want to get into the heart of what anarchism is. Is it a distinct political philosophy? Yes. But is it also a way of uh, behaving towards uh, other people? And that it is too. So it kind of shows how this, uh, you know, this type of education can influence people later on in their lives. And there's some continuity between Ferrer schools and later authoritarian school, anti-authoritarian schools uh, like Summerhill. Uh, Paul Goodman uh, was an active anarchist. Um, he was aware of what was going on in the Stelton colony. He was involved in founding the Summerhill Society in New York, as was the son of uh, two of the very prominent figures, a uh, long time uh, Ferrer school teachers um, was also involved in the Summerhill. So it's not something that just went away, um, but maybe it changed uh, characteristics at, when it, it ended. So I'm going to get into some of the shortfalls and pitfalls and uh, ask why did they decline, uh, what happened. I think the main reason why this specifically for rare um, 
um, inspired schools declined was a loss of interest. Um, there was a major flurry of interest at the beginning, um, but people were less inclined to really put in the effort for this specific project. A lot of times there would be conflicts between parents and instructors, and this kind of got both parents and instructors out of being interested in continuing with the Ferrer model. The schools were always dependent on having the right teachers and staff and also funding. And these were continual problems. It turned out to be very difficult to handle a classroom uh, full of rambunctious children and not subduing them. And it was not something that everybody was able to do. Just you know, in spite of what we might or might not like about uh, the anarchists at the time, you know, sometimes just because they had the right ideas didn't mean that they were that skilled. They didn't have necessarily the talent to put them into practice in this specific area. So they're really dependent on instructors, and sometimes the instructors uh, got really set in their ways about how the school should run, what's right for the children, and you'd see. I I don't I don't think it's fair to necessarily call it an authoritarian relationship with the the teachers and the students, but the instructors would sometimes uh, be very insistent on something happening a certain way, and funding uh, was a major problem. Um, you know, they got funds from philanthropists, from labor unions, and from running fundraisers. So it was difficult for them to really reach out and kind of have awesome facilities to attract people. And But for what they had, they, they did a good job of educating people. Uh, some... Schools in uh, particular, uh, one that I think exemplifies uh, this this downfall uh, is the school in Lakewood, New Jersey. It was established in 1933 by Nellie and James Dick after they left the Stelton colony. They were seeking an environment where there would be less of what they considered interference by parents. Um, enrollment in the school was typically 30 to 40 pupils per year. But in 1958, when the Dicks retired, um, Jim was 76 and Nellie was 65, the school closed down. Uh, there was no one really to keep it going. The New York City School um, had an interesting history. Uh, it was founded in 1911, uh, and it, for the first year, it was in a very small uh, location, but then it moved uh, uptown, uh, somewhere near Central Park. Uh, it's on the map if, if you want to go to the modern schools.wordpress.com. And uh, it was, it was like I said, it was a vibrant intellectual center in addition to being a school. They had a stage, they had an outdoor area. Sometimes children would be brought to Central Park. Um, so things, things were very good there. Uh, the problem was it wasn't able to insulate its operation from uh, the industrial conflict, the class struggle, whatever you want to call it, that was going on outside. And in the summer of 1914, uh, four people who were all attendees of the lectures at the Ferrer Center died in an explosion at a Lexington Avenue apartment. And this was due to a failed plot to bomb the Rockefeller Mansion in response to the Ludlow Massacre and violent attacks on demonstrations that were happening uh, in solidarity in, uh, in New York City and uh, in the counties just north of New York. The resulting uh, police and media pressure um, and significant withdrawal of financial support after this led to the closing of the school, and the um, school was moved to Stelton, New Jersey. So 
you have a case where uh, whatever um, the justice or injustice of the cause that these people are getting involved in, um, the fact that there was uh, people engaged in violence really brought a lot of negative attention to the school and for example, a, a wealthy philanthropist who supported the school because he saw it as a great um, nonconformist way to improve society was just outraged that its leaders were not, he didn't see them as condemning this uh, violence enough and he withdrew his significant funding. So the school moved to Stelton and a uh, colony was established there. Um, so th this is interesting. There's a long history of intentional communities in America, um, especially in the 19th and early 20th centuries. Um, you know, there, there, and the Northeast is not um, is not a stranger to those certainly. But this one was actually to be anchored by a Ferrer school. There is an abandoned farmstead in Stelton, New Jersey, which is. Uh, I, I haven't been able to find the exact location. It's something I would like to do, um, but it was uh, Stelton is basically the inter the intersection of Edison Township and Piscataway Township. If you're at all familiar with New Jersey, um, that's where it was. And uh, so they built out of this abandoned farmstead a whole community. Um, you know, there was. Uh, a, commonly held land for the school and the boarding house, um, but a lot of the land was held in small individually owned plots. There are cooperatives, but there are also people who commuted to work from there. And uh, they, they had a, a pretty thriving community. Um, certainly it wasn't without its problems, but people seem to uh, have a positive view of it. Um, but a particular problem, in addition to the general problems with the, uh, with the Ferrer schools, the loss of interest, the conflicts, the, the lack of funding, the Stelton community really suffered when the U.S. military established a base nearby, uh, Camp Kilmer. Um, soldiers there, you know, they, they, they hear about this anarchist free love colony that was nearby, and they wanted to get in on that. So you have this community where uh, it's somewhat isolated. People hardly even lock their doors. And uh, all of a sudden, there's all these outsiders coming through. Crime rises. Um, it's not really able to kind of hold this off. And with the loss of some of the important figures, the, the community uh, you know, didn't recover. So at this point, we're talking about, I was talk, well, I was talking about lessons, um, and I think this is, this is two of them, um, you know, not just a difficulty with intentional communities, but um, the difficulty of intentional communities to deal with the outside world. Um, and they had something that was going well, but they weren't really prepared to deal with the problems of communities around it. Um, and I don't think this is something that's uh, exclusive to intentional communities, but I think it was a major problem for the Stelton um, community. And the, the other thing is that uh, there were certain personalities who took leading roles in the project, and when they were gone, uh, there was a void that you know other people filled, but they might not have been as capable or as driven or as charismatic. Um, so that that was an issue that had to be dealt with. There is another, um, I, I guess, utopian community centered around a Ferrer school, and that was in uh, Mohegan, New York. Um, I forget what what county, but uh, one of the southern counties uh, north of uh, of New York City. Um, it's uh, once again, it's on the awesome map at themodernschools.wordpress.com. If you click on the schools tab, and uh, this one, it was a lot more scenic than the Stelton community. It was on a beautiful lakeside. There are mountains around there, um, and this went for a little while. But 
I uh, it it just like the others uh, there was a loss of interest, but it had another uh, major problem, and that is it got kind of caught up in the Cold War. It wasn't just an anarchist community. None of these were ever just anarchist communities, although they, you could argue they're founded on anarchist principles. Uh, it is certainly a fact that there are a lot of anarchists involved in them and uh, you know, not just uh, participating in, uh, in kind of a, a lax fashion, but actually kind of driving the, the ideas here. But they weren't all anarchists. Um, the Mohegan community had a large subset of residents who started subscribing to Leninism. And during the Cold War, uh, well, not just during the Cold War, but before, there are conflicts between the pro-Soviet elements um, and the anti-Soviet elements, um, anarchists, uh, more libertarian socialists, and probably uh, some radical liberals as well. And this really kind of took the community apart. Um, you know, people were trying to get kids to sign up for the Young Pioneers and things like that. And obviously, a lot of people resented this influence. But possibly even worse than that, um, the areas around there, uh, you know, they were starting to be built up, suburbanized, and they really didn't like all these communists being around there. So there were anti-communist riots, there were racist riots, and that took a toll also on the community. Um, and it, it, it uh, became, in the words of one participant, uh, just, another, just another suburban uh, town. So that uh, school uh, lasted, uh, let's see, until... The Mohegan School um, was, it was by Cromhound, New York. Um, it was from 1924 to 1941. Um, so that, that was uh, one, and the, the longest running one was the one in Stelton, but the latest in operation was the one in Lakewood, which once the teachers uh, who were involved quit, nobody kept it going. Um, and I think the Mohegan community especially points to a potential pitfall with intentional communities, um, especially when they're isolated. You don't have a Mohegan community, you know, right next to another community that someone could uh, go to. And uh, the alternative to when you're talking about an intentional community, the alternatives are not the same as, you know, you like a different hardware store better, so you'll go 15 minutes out of your way to go to this hardware store when you need some nails. It's, it's you have to uproot yourself, um, and there is obviously a major commitment, uh, both physically and ideologically, to even go to a community like this. So there's a lot invested in there. So the there's the alternatives are scarce, and people will uh, fight out the meaning of this community. What is its purpose? What are we doing here? Um, it it's not something that a lot of times there's an alternative to that people can uh, you know just say all right, well I like this model better. Uh, let's found this. It's there's one community. It's isolated. People are heavily invested in it. And some people want to change it, and some people don't, and you have a conflict that develops that way. So uh, I'm going to conclude this and get to your questions. It looks like I'll have about five minutes for questions. Um, the modern school movement, um, heavily anarchist, but not exclusively so, a major experiment in libertarian education that uh, provided pockets of freedom to those who participated, to the students, um, provided new models uh, that did have an impact on later schools, but the Ferrer model or the Ferrer Society, that affiliation itself died out by the late 1950s. Um, so I hope you enjoyed this and I will get to your questions. Uh, okay. Um, not a whole lot of questions. Um, 
Uh, comment from Stefan Kinsella. You made me think about Montessori with your comments about desks and grids, etc. Montessori does not do this. Um, there's actually, I don't remember exactly the interactions people had between, there was a lot of different models for schooling uh, when the modern schools were being founded. And I know some of the teachers were very much in favor of Montessori, others thought it was too authoritarian. Um, so that it's, there's not a, uh, they're, they're related. There's not, well, it's not a very intimate or uh, close relationship, but uh, they're not in isolation, Montessori and modern schools. Um, and another comment, never heard of this alternative modern school movement. It does sound similar to unschooling. Yeah, I think it does. Um, one thing that I actually like uh, about the modern schools also is that there's a social element to them. Uh, the the students are, you know, they're not, I mean, I'm not trying to imply that unschooling goes a certain way because obviously that's not how it is. But a lot of times when people hear of uh, parents taking responsibility for the education of their children away from the state, they, they sometimes think of isolation, which is, is certainly not fair and not the case uh, a lot of times. But with the, the modern schools especially, there's a lot of social interaction. Uh, so there's that is developed. The students themselves will put on a play. Um, they will kind of direct the lessons they want to learn. Uh, I haven't really read too much into how this uh, this worked in practice uh, as in terms of the social element of this. Um, I, I don't know how much it was kept so that the uh, more uh, I guess the more extroverted students didn't tend to dominate the lesson or if um, it encouraged all students to participate on a you know relatively equal basis where uh, you know no one would just go along with a crowd. Um, from the, the reading I've done it doesn't seem like that was the case where you had a lot of conformity in, in the modern schools um, so it's not exactly uh, specifically related to this comment here, but uh, it's, it's just something I, you know, I'm thinking of uh, in relation to this. So I don't see any other questions or comments. Um, once again, you can read a little bit more about this uh, at uh, the D Modern School Movement Digital History Project, which is themodernschools.wordpress.com. Um, unfortunately, most of this is based on, uh, at the website, is based on Paul Average's uh, work. I didn't get a whole lot into, um, let's see if I can get this one on the screen, uh, Lawrence uh, Vesey's The Communal Experience. Um, there's also a link to this, on, to the Go there's a link to the Google Books page for this at the, the website. There's an extensive section on the Stelton Colony. Uh, which I haven't got into too much, but basically uh, the book was written in the early 1970s. Um, and kind of the author was fascinated with intentional communities and especially the countercultural tradition in America, and this was examined in uh, relation uh, to that line of thinking. Uh, Paul Average's book published in 1980. Paul Average. Um, prolific historian. He studied uh, Eastern Europe, but also anarchist movements worldwide. Um, he published uh, Anarchist Voices, which was uh, based on interviews with a number of anarchists, some of which were involved or knew people involved in the modern schools. So that's that's another good source. Uh, but Paul Average, uh, he managed to really gain the respect and trust of a lot of anarchists. Um, so just on the on the website, you know, it's there's a navigation bar under the picture. Um, you know, there's personalities involved, which I didn't really get into too much uh, in the in the presentation here. There's additional resources. Some are things you can view online. Some are books. Um, and like I said, I I do hope to incorporate some more information into the project later. Uh, and if you're interested, uh, you can um, contact me. My uh, email address is darianwarden at gmail.com. 
and uh, my website is darianwarden.com. So be interested in hearing uh, more feedback on this. So it looks like I'm about to the concluding time of my presentation today. And let's see, how is this? Well, one more question. Uh, how is this different from the myriad of charter schools that are popping up? Well, it's different because it's a different model of schooling. Um, I'm not too familiar with exactly what model charter schools uh, are doing, but my sense is that a lot of them are based on uh, the, you know, similar to how public schools do it, where you have kind of uh, a, you know, you have the teachers in charge, you have the students under, you have grades, you have things like that. The Ferrer model is closer to the Summerhill schools of today. Um, and uh, it was a little, a little bit more similar to the Montessori schools than a lot of the uh, other private schools. So um, charter schools just means they get a charter from the government, uh, whereas Ferrer schools is a specific model of education that they're using. So there could be a charter school that is very similar, um, but just because it's a charter school, it doesn't mean uh, that they're using any particular model. So thank you for listening. Again, this has been uh, Agora IO. Uh, thank you to George for setting this up again. And uh, you can check out the Modern School Movement uh, at the Digital History Project. And you can check out more of uh, my work, my anarchist commentary, and uh, my analysis. Um, I do a lot at Alliance Journal. I write at Center for Stateless Society. I have currently doing a podcast, uh, Thinking Liberty, and I'm a graduate student of history, so you'll see a lot of that at my website, darianwarden.com. If you don't know how to spell it, just Google it. You'll find it. And uh, thank you for listening. Um, I hope you enjoy the rest of the Agora presentations. Bye.